Welcome to Living Fuel TV. I'm Casey Crazy with my special guest, Dr. Leonard Smith. Welcome, Leonard. Thank you, Casey. It's a pleasure to be here. Leonard is one of my dear friends and one of the most brilliant doctors that I've ever met. And you know what? A, what an incredible mind you have. My wife always says, I think you've said this in another segment that that you need a, a, a pad and paper when Leonard's around because of the ideas flow and the concepts and so on. So it's a, this is a special series we're doing with Dr. Smith. Normally we try to answer all your health questions. Now I'm trying to get a lot of my health questions answered by Dr. Smith and bringing in the pieces that I know to hopefully answer questions you haven't even asked yet. So today we'll talk about Let's go with vitamin D because there's some fascinating things about vitamin D. It's all in the news oh, now. Yeah. We've, been, we've been talking about vitamin D for years now, yeah. Leonard. And, and it's just been, it's, it's like the vitamin C of the 1900s. You know, it's, uh, it's and like, more. And, and more. And even more. As a matter of fact, I think if uh, President Obama really wanted to have a health care plan, that's the first thing they would do, honestly, is insist that everybody have their vitamin D. And when you do the vitamin D level, you know you've checked the 25 OH vitamin D. OH stands, for, OH stands for hydroxy. It's just a chemical term. You've got vitamin D and there's an oxygen and a hydrogen attached uh, on it and so that's why it's called 25 OH vitamin so D. So check your 25 OH vitamin D. And if it's under 30 nanograms per milliliter, even all conventional doctors would say you're insufficient. If it's under 20, it's dangerously insufficient. I've seen patients as low as 1 and 2 and 5 and things like that. Vitamin D levels are changing the way we think about disease even. You know, vi vitamin yeah. D insufficiency. I, I saw one study that said that 65% of all people are vitamin D insufficient or deficient. Right. And that was using 30 nanograms per deciliter as the marker. And now we know that's double. Right. So if well, you take a 60 nanogram per deciliter marker or even higher, even, exactly. what's, what's the, the, the rate of of people who are deficient. Uh, it's 90? probably gone from a billion to two billion or three billion of the planet Earth. Really, that's how significant it is. And this isn't just conjecture. This is several scientists, and one of the best one I'd say is Michael Hollick, who's an MD, PhD at Harvard, submitting materials that are published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So this is really definitely mainstream medicine. I'd also at least like to point out, if people want to know more about it, they can go to vitamindcouncil.org. That's uh, John Connell, who lives in California. Now, Dr. Connell had some fascinating research when he had the one floor of patients all on vitamin D, search, testing it for some other reason, and then right. they had the epidemic come through the entire hospital, right. and lo and behold, nobody on his floor. Well, well it's actually even different than that, but I, I, I definitely read that one, and it was, I think, either in Minnesota or Wisconsin, but it was a center for handicapped people right. that were not capable of living on their own. So you could imagine what other potential problems they had, but because they were patients in the center, they were all given vitamin D. The staff that took care of them weren't taking vitamin D. And the only ones to get the flu were the staff taking care of them, not the patients. Very interesting. And then there's other doctors out there that have absolutely, one family practice doctor in Atlanta, uh, I saw her talk at a meeting recently, uh, she, checks all of her patients' vitamin D levels and gets them up to a good, healthy, normal level around at least 50 nanograms per milliliter. And the fellow that shares the office with her but has a different set of patients, what a great study. Hers weren't getting the flu. She's not seen H1N1 yet. And the other doctors seen both. Wouldn't it be very interesting groups. to see all the ones that have been tested for H1N1, and we know that that number is extremely low compared to the ones that they thought had H1N1. Right. But it would be interesting to know the vitamin D levels of those ones that had H1N1. It would be low. It would absolutely I would be low. just about bet on it. It's, it's interesting that in the cold weather, you know, the cold part right. of the year, right. it's cold and flu season. That would be our first clue. You know that and people. The sun that, isn't around either. The sun isn't around. And you're not in it. Gets even darker if it is. earlier yeah, when you're well. north, farther away from the equator. Yeah. The more you're not going to get any conversion. Plus, people aren't out in the sun anyway. And when they do go in the sun, they put in sunscreen, which blocks right. the conversion. So there's all kind of reasons people's right. people's D levels are down. But it's almost malpractice not to put D in the process to look at the levels, don't you think? Yeah, I don't want to get political about it, but I would agree with that. At, at this point, there's enough information out there. There's no excuse for any doctor not checking their patient's 25 OH vitamin D level. Uh, there will still be ongoing arguments about whether it should be 50, 80. Some are now even saying up to 100. But think about this one, the number of mothers that have had autistic kids who had vi low vitamin D level their entire pregnancy. 
and the child doesn't have a chance. And we know in the first trimester of pregnancy, during brain development, vitamin D is really critical. Then throughout the entire gestation, vitamin D is critical in terms of, if you think about it, vitamin D is responsible for a thousand genes to function with regard to immunity and inflammation, which has to do with everything from infections to cancer to heart disease and strokes to Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis to all the autoimmunity diseases uh, to skin diseases. There is nothing they've looked at that they haven't found that it could be useful to normalize vitamin D. Well, I want to get into something that probably no one listening or watching today has heard, because you're the one that told me this, about the function of vitamin D on the anti-inflammation level. It actually goes to an anti-inflammatory nutrient. Oh, yeah. Well, again, as I just said, out of those thousand genes, a lot of them have to do with inflammation. And if you've got the right vitamin D, that will work. Here's another one that most people don't know, but like even in terms of your body energy, that's back to the thyroid. And very simply, you know, you make thyroid hormones in your thyroid, they get in the blood, and they go throughout the body. And, and one of them is called T4, and all that is is a tyrosine molecule with four iodines on it. That's what it looks like, it swims through the blood. And when it gets inside the cell, the thyroid also makes T3, so you've got two iodines on one side and one on the other. It's really simple. They both get inside the cell. T4 has got to get deiodinated. You take an iodine off to convert to T3. T3 then swims to the nucleus and actually affects genetic transcription to make mitochondrial proteins to make more mitochondria. What's mitochondria? They're the little engines. They're the little engines that are in the cytoplasm of the cell that make our energy. Without them, you're dead. When they get sick and tired, you get sick and tired. People aren't sick and tired. Their mitochondria are sick and tired. But are you ready for this one? They've actually shown that if you don't have a vitamin D level that's at least 40, the T3 won't even go into the nucleus to help do what the thyroid hormones do, which is upregulate energy production by basically creating messages for the cell to make more mitochondria or, or to repair damaged ones or whatever. So didn't you say there's some reason that it turns to RT3 and not T3 in this process or is that a different process? No, that too. We're back to that's a little bit different issue, but if you've got T4 here and you've got T3 here, you need an enzyme called 5' prime deiodinase. It's just a big name, but deiodinase means you've got four iodines on the, on the tyrosine and it's just going to pull one off and pulls one off, now over here you've got T3. And T3 is the active thyroid hormone. T4 is really like FedEx. It's just carrying uh, it over to there to take the iodine off. Why so God did used. that, I don't know, but that's, that's, I'm sure we'll find some use for T4. That's the most exciting part of this. I, every day I open the computer and I have all these news and journal things I go to. Every day something's changing. Well, we're every day. This is fascinating. We're going to go into more of that in another segment, but that okay. is fascinating. Well, thank, thank you, Leonard. You. Yeah. We, we just wish you super health. Hope you enjoyed it.